let me make sure I tell you a little bit about myself and, and why you should listen to me. I am a former real estate agent. I have a twin sister. She and I got our real estate licenses about 35 years ago. She's still an agent. I decided that real estate sales wasn't necessarily a good fit for me. So I got into the safety business. I started, I opened a store where I was selling safety items, pepper spray, alarms, all of that good stuff, child, uh, baby safety, child safety, home security, all things safety and security. And then I needed to get out and start talking. So mall life was not a good fit either, but I stayed in the safety business. That's where my passion was. I started speaking all over Kansas City. That's where I'm um, where I'm based. And after I touched every single real estate office here and talked to all the agents here, I grew nationally. So I was speaking all over the country, which is what I do now. And I, I've never counted the states, but I know it's more than 30 or so states. I, I need to sit down and count one day. And then now I'm international because I created a safety program for the Canadian Real Estate Association. So I am international and um, I take seriously what I do. My goal is not only to teach you how to work, how to work and live safely, but how to be more productive being safe. So the question is, why am I here? The National Association of Realtors mandates that all associations and boards must have some kind of safety training. And I'm it. But I, I'm, I'm sure you have other safety training, but I am honored to be among those um, providing expert led training to you. And I have to give kudos to your leadership there at the um, OC Realtors for valuing expertise um, and saying, hey, whatever the topic may be. And I, I look at your calendar. I know what you all are doing that you say we want people who are true experts because our members deserve the best. So kudos to your leadership in that aspect. I often have people say, how are we supposed to know what's going on in the world? Um, what's happening with real estate agents? Where are the crimes? Are there crimes happening? Uh, where do we find resources? I created a group on Facebook where I talk nothing but real estate safety. I'm going to give you a link at the end where you can just click on that and join the group. But that's just a, an educational group. You can have conversations there. But the number one thing is that's where you go to find out what's happening in the world of real estate safety and security. I had a broker tell me one time, she said, Tracy, I'd love to hire you. You know, what you say is great. The information is wonderful. She said, but it's not a good business investment. And I'm thinking, what? She said, agents will not show up for any kind of training unless you're teaching them how to make more money. I always ask, is that true? But I know on some level it's true. It has to be true. You're commission-based. So what I had to do is I had to put on my thinking cap. What can I do? How can I make safety profitable? How can I help real estate agents increase their bottom lines using safety? So I created the country's only real estate safety designation. And over, I want to say 750 agents have completed it, where I teach agents not only how to work safely and make it home every night, but how to make more money doing so. And that's by protecting the consumer. Now, those are two, three hour CE classes. We don't have time for that today. However, my goal today is to pack as much information as possible. And so when you walk away today, you will walk away not only knowing real life actionable ways to stay safe, I'm going to give you some tools, some handouts to teach you how to protect the consumer. You know, here's how you stand out with the sellers, the buyers, and even FISBOs. How to teach them how to be safe and how to lead with safety so that you're known as the real estate, the safety agent. That's going to help you build your business. I always, we, we're talking lessons learned. I'm a storyteller. Um, anyone here know the Beverly Carter story who is comfortable enough to raise their hand? And then Elsie can unmute you and you can share the story with us. Is there anyone who is comfortable doing that? And while you're getting to the raise your hand button and saying if you want to, <clears throat> let me backtrack and let you all know that I was recently selected to be the host of the NAR Safety Podcast. It's called The Drive with NAR, the safety series. So I get a big voice, a big platform, and I get to share stories. And I always want to hear from you all. And this Lessons Learned is right up my alley. I also write for Realtor Magazine, Inman, RIS Media, as well as The Close. So I am I'm passionate about safety. I think that's an understatement. Um, anyone have their hand raised? Anyone want to jump in and briefly share the Beverly Carter story with us? Hi, this is Veronica. Hi, Veronica. I've heard of the safe of the Beverly Carter story. She's the one that went out 
the day before Thanksgiving to show a property in a rural area and never came home. And she was found later in the trunk of her car. You know what, Veronica, you know what? That's actually a different story. Oh. And I had forgot, I had forgot about that story. Story. That's a whole totally different story. But thank you for reminding me. Um, and it's sad that there's more than one, right? Yes. Um, but thank you for bringing that up. Um, I see, I thought I saw, is it Jim Thorpe? I thought, Jim Thor, I see another hand up. Yeah, um, thank you, Veronica. Here. Jim, can you jump in? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Yeah, I remember the story quite well. Uh, I recall she was trying to take efforts that she could just be safe. Um, and then she met this gentleman at the at her listing. And, um, of course, got accosted and, you know, all that. And uh, But I think there's some safety lessons to learn from that is that, uh, unfortunately, in the real estate business, we all put photographs, we all put pictures on our real estate sign. And unfortunately, women put um, pictures that are attractive, their most attractive pictures. And unfortunately, that's what ends up happening. Um, she was trying to be as mindful as she could ahead of it. But this gentleman um, met her at the house and then um, things went downhill from there. So um, I can't remember at all firsthand. I did remember it quite a bit before, but it's a lot to be less, a lot of lessons to be learned from what happened to her that day. Okay, and thank you, Jim. And you're actually talking about another story as well, but you're you have some of the Beverly Carter story in there, but you all are you're great. You're reminding me of other stories that I don't have included today. Um, so thank you so much for jumping in. And then the lesson to be learned, I want to talk about what you said, okay? Um, Beverly Carter was a real estate agent in Little Rock, Arkansas. She got a phone call and the guy said, this is a cash buyer. And me being a former agent, and you all know what we do when you hear cash buyer, right? She was excited. She immediately made that appointment. Then she had second thoughts sitting in her office. She's like, what have I done? You know, I don't know him. I've got a weird feeling. And the reason I know that is that I had an opportunity to interview her office mate. Her office mate said that she had second thoughts about meeting this guy alone. So she picked up the phone and she called and she said, look, I'm just not comfortable meeting you alone. He said, oh, don't worry. My wife will be there. So Beverly goes to the property and it's just him. And at that point, um, she said, you know, your wife is supposed to be here. He said she had to work. So let's just do a FaceTime. That way she can look with us. And of course, those were the last images on Beverly's phone. At that point, they proceeded, he proceeded to kidnap her and then murder her. Now that happened during safety month, which is September. And I want to say 2013, 2014. And that story has resonated. We're still talking about it to this day. And I think that's for a number of reasons. Number one is that it happened um it's with something that we all as real estate agents have done. You have met a stranger in an empty house. The results, of course, are not normal. So that's what woke us up. That got our attention. And um, Jim, you mentioned something else. You said her photograph. We're going to talk about real estate agents and pictures. And um, again, that's this is one business where pictures on business cards is the norm. And now you'll notice that everyone has their pictures on billboards, on business cards, from plumbers to service people. Now everyone's copying you all. Um, people sometimes, and I, I had a lady say to me um, when we were talking about the need to have pictures on your um, business cards and your literature, she said, I'm old and ugly. No one wants me. It's not how you look to criminals. Criminals are looking for something in particular. It could be someone older, someone younger. It could be someone with red hair, brown eyes. They're looking for something in particular. And so we can't blame women for being attractive and we can't blame them for putting a picture of who they are on their cards. Um, and we, of course, we would never blame the victims. But when I, by the time we get done, pay attention to who the victims have been. And then we'll revisit that um, because that, that's a, a common perception in the industry. After Beverly Carter died, her family sued the real estate company for neglect. They said if there was safety training, they believed that Beverly would be here today. 
As a result, my thinking cap goes on again. It's like, how can I help brokers, managers, and owners avoid being sued successfully? So I had to create a certification class where I talk to, to leadership about protecting your office. That means the four walls, what's inside your equipment, the people, not just the agents, setting up safe practices. So if something does happen, you can show that you did your best to protect them. So I had to create another class, and I want to say maybe 250 um, brokers or owners have completed the class. And I also created a handbook, a safe practice handbook. No one else had done that. So I'm always thinking, how do we reduce the crime and how do we put systems in place? And that's pretty much what I do. Next question, who can tell me a risk involved in being a real estate agent? Just click, raise your hand or unmute. Um, who can tell me a risk involved in being a real estate agent? Just jump on in there. Something that you think about every day when you leave your office. Pamela has her hand raised. Go ahead, Pamela. I think we um, risk, whether we're male or female, our, our level of trust is um, a companion to the idea of being productive. So we put our own personal safety at risk with the idea of making a sale. And especially if a house is vacant, I would never go there. Um, and without somebody with me, but we do take that risk, men and women, um, in an open house. Excellent. Yeah, an open house. We open ourselves up and we put a sign out that says, come in and kill me. I mean, open house <laughs> kind of means that. I know, I'm right. sorry. But, uh, mommy, but I mean, what you're saying, I see I see where you're coming from, but that's kind of blunt, but I, I do see where you're coming from. I just had a class where an agent said to me, she said, but I'm, you know, I'm a salesperson. I'm supposed to trust people. It's like, stop you are not required to trust anyone. So I had to stop her right then and there. An excellent point about the male female. Um, thank you so much for jumping in. Uh, did I see another hand raised? A risk involved in the jobs that you do. Okay. You all, your job description reads that you make a living meeting complete strangers in empty houses. You make a living sitting in empty houses and waiting for a stranger to walk in. And I recently heard someone else say, you know, we're the only profession where we invite someone. This is kind of to your point, Pamela, where we invite someone into a house and we lock the door, possibly locking ourselves behind the door with someone who is going to harm us. So it's the exact same thing. So those are the risks involved in the job that you do. That's your job description. The U.S. Department of Labor considers real estate sales and leasing a high risk hazardous occupation. You're up there with the convenience store clerks, with the um, was the taxi drivers, and there are still taxi drivers. I just got back from DC and I am not an Uber girl yet, but I do ride taxis and there's still a lot of taxi drivers. So think about the dangers there. Um, with uh, security, law enforcement, your jobs are considered dangerous by the US Department of Labor just based on the job description. My job is not to scare you, but to remove the danger so that you can make a living in this occupation and do it in a safe way. And the added bonus is I'm going to teach you how to do it and to protect the consumer. That's how you're going to build your business doing it. Now, the National Association of Realtors issues a member safety residential report every year during safety month. So it is out now. That's how they take the temperature of what's going on in the real estate world. What are your concerns? What are your fears? What are the dangers that you see? How are you handling them? What do you see as um, regarding what the solutions are? So it's a great read. And I, I strongly encourage you to take a peek and see what your fellow agents are saying regarding safety in the industry. Now, today we're going to talk lessons learned. I had the opportunity, I wanna say a couple of years ago to speak at the NAR annual conference in San Diego. The topic was lessons learned. So we, talk, we talked stories and that's what I wanna to do today. We're going to talk about stories against of crimes against real estate agents. Um, I had to shorten and remove some of the stories because sometimes it's too much. And I, my goal, again, is not to scare agents, but every single story has a lesson to be learned so that that story is not repeated. So there have been um, a rise in crimes against real estate agents, although it's hard to pinpoint how many crimes and where, although the Department of Labor estimates that to be about 60 or 65 murders per year. The problem is we don't hear those stories. We don't hear every story. I hear a lot of the stories, I write about them either on my Facebook page when I see them, or I write about them for one of the publications. 
or I incorporate them in the programs, but we don't hear every single story. So there are things that are happening that you don't know about. So the ones we know about, let's learn from them. One of the first stories I wanted to talk about is a real estate agent who was evicting tenants in a building. Right there on the spot, they murdered him. Now, just to talk a little bit about the tenant deal, my my sister happens to be not only a realtor, but she is also a housing provider slash landlord and, um, and an investor. During the eviction moratorium, the tenant situation, the tenant, um, I don't know what to call it, crisis, um, put her in more danger. So if you are a landlord, you know there is a different kind of danger than real estate agent danger. And then um, in Australia, and I can't turn it off. I'm always hearing stories, knowing stories. It got to the point in Australia where um, landlords and leasing agents are wearing body cameras because people were so awful to them. So they fig figured if we wear body cameras, we let the tenants know we are wearing these. So if something happens, there are witnesses. It got that bad. In my sister's situation, the focus was on tenants, you know, Tenants don't have anywhere to live. Tenants can't work. So how dare you put them out? Housing is a right. They should be able to live there for free. And my sister is the one who said, wait a minute, this is my business. You know, this is how I, I operate. This is how my husband and I fund our bills and fund our lives. And as a result, there was a target on her. So there is a whole different, a, a different ball game when it comes to uh, property management and the tenant situation. So there are lessons to be learned there. And I have a whole class on that. It's a whole different deal. This story happened in Colorado. There was a real estate agent in a room. She was showing a client. He decided that he is going to pull out a can of bear spray and a knife. That agent pulled out her gun and she started shooting at him. She didn't hit him, but he went away. She was safe. She survived. They eventually caught him. So the lesson learned there is if you're going to have a weapon, it needs to be accessible. That means you can get to it in a hurry. You need to know how to use it and you need to be willing to use it. Now, when we talk about weapons, keep in mind that NAR doesn't have a policy on weapons. What they recommend is that you check with your state and local association to find out whether or not you can carry a firearm. And if that is okay there and you're able to do so legally, then you need to check with your brokerage to make sure your broker owner allows that. And if so, then the lesson learned is let, let that be comfortable enough carrying that weapon, be prepared to use it. So that means practice, practice, practice. When NAR surveyed the members, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, firearms are the number two choice of weapons that agents use. As I travel the country, I'm telling you, more and more people are saying yes, consult and carry, or we have weapons. So that is becoming more popular. And I often hear people say, well, I don't, I don't want them taking it away and using it against me. If you are trained, if you're willing to use it, you're comfortable with it, which means that you've practiced, they're not going to be able to get close enough to take it away from you. The concern I have is when I have an agent who will come up and she'll say, um, it's, it's been women so far, my, my husband or my spouse, whatever, wants me to carry a gun and I'm just not comfortable doing it, but they're insisting. Now that's a situation where someone is reluctant, where they're likely not going to have good command and control of that gun. And that's when a gun could possibly be taken from them and used against them. So if it's a, a weapon that you are comfortable with, whether it's pepper spray or a gun, then that's the one for you. There are no right or wrong answers as long as you're following the law. Now you all are probably familiar with this story about the real estate agent there in California who the previous weekend, she had an open house and this guy came through. He, something was just off. She was not completely comfortable with him. He left. The next weekend he came back. And at that point she said, look, you're not here to see the house. You have to go. She walked him outside and you see she is blurred in the image and that grassy patch behind her. He pushed her down in that grassy patch and he started to assault her. And in that situation, I can still hear her blood curdling screams. Um, the lesson learned there is that that real estate agent, first and foremost, listened to her gut. Her gut says something is wrong here. She couldn't make anything else out, but she knew that he wasn't there to see the house. And she did not ignore that voice. And she told him, you have to go. She was not scared to say that. She said, you're not here to see the house. Number two, she was aware of that camera. She knew there was a camera on the porch. So her goal was to get him out there where the camera was. 
And once he pushed her down and started assaulting her, she screamed and screamed. Criminals don't like witnesses. She knew at some point that someone was going to look over that way or he would think that someone would look over that way. She survived. I wrote an article about the things that she did right in order to survive. And again, at the end of the presentation today, I'm going to give you a link. You can read these articles and you can share these articles. But the, the key is, what does it take to survive? And then I outline, outline exactly what she did to survive. Now, this situation, and I'm, on this one, I'm going to ask you what the lesson learned is. So let me tell you the story. This real estate agent was hosting an open house and the guy, he was in the house. He left, he came back with a wrench. He proceeded to hit her in the face and head area 10 to 12 times. She just happened to be a black belt. She put up a fight. So yes, she was injured. And yes, she um, had a long road to recovery. If you would raise your hand, someone jump in and tell me what the lesson to be learned in that situation is for your fellow real estate agents. What can we learn from that agent's survival that can help us and other agents in that same situation? I don't think I see any hands up. So, okay, Veronica and Sarah. So we'll do Veronica first and then Sarah can jump in. Go ahead, Veronica. You have to unmute, Veronica, if you're talking, we can't hear you. So if you will unmute yourself and then jump right in. I think the lesson learned was that she fought back. Excellent point. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. Okay. And then Sarah. Um, I think just having some kind of self-defense training is probably helpful and it helped save her probably most likely. Yeah. Excellent point. Both of you, nail, you hit the nail on the head. She just happened to be a black belt. You don't have to be a black belt, but the self-defense training is what's important. When someone says, oh, they're offering a self-defense class, I'm going to take it. One and done is not enough. One class will not do the trick. You have to take it on a regular basis. After a while, it becomes muscle memory, but you can't take one class and think that you know enough. Of course, you don't have to be a black belt, but just taking a class on a regular basis so that you're comfortable enough and that you know what to do in a dangerous situation. So that. It's a lesson learned in that story. So thank you both for jumping in. And yes, she fought back. Even if you don't have any self-defense classes, you have to determine if fight or flight is the key to survive and there's no right or wrong answer. 70% of the realtors who took the survey actually took a class. And again, one and done is not enough. Here's where the lesson learned is particularly um, sad for me. Monique Bao met the exact same fate as Beverly Carter. Monique Bao was in the exact same situation in 2020. She got a phone call from someone she did not know who wanted to see a property. She met that person at the property and they kidnapped her and they killed her. Exact same story. And having been an agent before and talked to thousands of agents every year, I know that it happens on a regular basis. I'd like to hear from someone who can tell me what the lesson learned is in those two stories. What can you do to make sure you don't meet the same fate? And it's a simple answer, but I want an actionable answer. One that you actually do or one that you would actually do to keep yourself from being in that same situation. Yes, Veronica. Um, we can't hear you. Unmute. Never show a house alone. Now, is that realistic? I hear people saying that. I hear agents oh, saying that. Right. And I also see the eye rolls. So tell me how you get around showing a property alone. I take my husband with me. Ah, good for you. Is he a partner, a real estate partner? Or you just say, I need you to go with me? No, he's just big. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and um, we're going to talk about that. But the point is, there truly is safety in numbers. So good for you. Now, in any story that you hear about crimes against real estate agents, you never hear about two agents being victimized. You just don't hear it. That is a powerful sentiment that you need to remember. And then people always say, well, if I get a call, I've got to go. I'm going to go. I'm going to share a story with you. Um, I mentioned that I host the NAR 
Safety Podcast. On the very first episode, which aired in July, I interviewed a real estate agent who was raped. She said she got to the property, she said, and when she, she didn't know him in advance, she said, well, when she got there, then at the door, before they were opening the door, she knew there was a problem. She said, I knew better. She said, but the problem is I needed that commission. And if I would have told him, let me meet you somewhere else first, I feel like he would have gone somewhere else and I needed that commission. So that's where we need to make sure that we don't let the, the, the commission make us skip those safety steps. And I always say there is never a reason for you to show a loan as long as there are new real estate agents out there. And lately, I've been talking to a lot of new real estate agents who always say they would do anything to accompany a veteran agent while they're working just to learn what to do. There's never an excuse. When we talk about open houses, lenders, title companies, they would do backflips to co-host with you. So you truly can't avoid working alone. But if you do have to work alone, if you just have to, I'm going to talk to you about ways to do that in a safer manner. Here's another story in Nebraska. This one reminds me of the very first story that I told you. This real estate agent, he and his son uh, were investors and he went to the property just like the very first real estate agent, either to collect keys or paperwork. And when he got there, the guy, the tenant murdered him and stuffed his body in the crawl space. So in that situation, lessons learned. Can anyone tell me what the lesson learned would be in the situation with this real estate agent slash investor slash landlord and the very first story that I told you about the investor real estate agent who went to evict someone. Can anyone think of a lesson learned in that situation? Um, yes, Pamela. You need to unmute. I would say what I said before, never assume that you're safe just because you're a male. Or if you're a female, never assume that you're safe because you're you're well trained or or you have a weapon because you can't ever trust what the other guy knows and what they can do to you. Exactly. Thank you for bringing that up. The, the male female thing again, as well as the trust thing again, you are not required or obligated to trust anyone and males and females both need to be aware and we're going to touch upon that. Thank you so much for jumping in. In Nashville, Tennessee, a real estate agent was showing his client. They were at the door and he was opening the lockbox and a teenager showed up with a gun and said, run for your life. So that real estate agent was thinking, do I take this kid on or do I run? He, he paused for a moment. His gut told him to run. So he threw his car keys and he ran. He survived. Now that teenager criminal took his car. He stole his car. So what happened is that agent happened to have his iPad in the car with the location turned on. He was able to lead law enforcement to his vehicle. He recovered his car and he survived. The lesson learned there is when your gut tells you something, listen to it. He might have thought he could have taken the teenager, but something inside said, don't even try it. So good for him. He survived. There, and this is another California story, and I'm sure you all are familiar with this one. A brother and sister had a house um, after their parents died. The sister wanted to sell it. The brother said, no, I think he lived there. And then she wanted to sell it against his will. Two inspectors and a real estate, no, two real estate agents and an inspector showed up to the listing appointment. He shot all three of them. The two agents were wounded. The inspector was killed. Who can tell me the invaluable, there are two or three really key lessons to be learned in that situation. Can anyone tell me what you can do to make sure you never find yourself in that situation when you show up for a listing appointment? Go ahead and raise your hand. And this is one that really touches upon every single real estate agent who goes to a property for a listing appointment. I don't see any hands raised, so let me jump in. I have no problem talking. So let me jump in. Number one lesson learned is if you have a pre-meeting, whether it's with your buyers or your sellers, you get to gauge the temperature, whether it's a phone call. But what I 
what I recommend is during the pandemic, we all had to do something that we all thought we would never do, that we thought we, we wouldn't need to do. We all had to learn to work in a virtual manner. I, mean, I, I know some states, everyone didn't have to do it, but most states, you have to be virtual. Here in Kansas City, no one was going anywhere. And I know other states. Um, so you had to learn how to work virtually. So you had to learn how to do a Zoom. I, for a long time, have been advocating for Zoom meetings, Zoom first meetings. Um, the first meeting is great if you go to the office, but what I know is that most agents will not do it. A majority of you all will never do it. So saying go to the office first is kind of a waste. And that's what the agent, um, her name is Nina, in the, first, um, in the first episode of the podcast, that's what she said. I know I should have done it, she said, but I didn't want to do it because I was afraid I would anger him and he would go to an agent who would not require him to go to the office. So I always said first meeting, but after I know agents were ignoring me, it's like, I'm not gonna waste my time. A first virtual meeting is ideal. Now, after the pandemic, no one can say we don't know how to do that. Everyone had to learn to be virtual in order to stay social and to stay connected. So we had to learn how to do that, right? So let's imagine in this situation, if the agent said, look, um, let's go ahead and jump on real quick Zoom and talk about the listing before I come over so I can get everything in order so that it can be a productive meeting. During that first Zoom, I am guaranteeing that you could have detected that he was not willing to sell the house. You would be able to see the tension between the two and you can see that he's probably extremely angry and didn't want to participate. So in that situation, you can take a step back and say, this is going to be dangerous or let me take someone with me or let me prepare in another way. So the first meeting can uh, allow you to gauge the disposition of who you're going to meet. Also to be more productive, people do a FaceTime and they will turn their camera around in a heartbeat. You can say, let me get the lay of the land. Just, you know, let me see the house. And most sellers would willingly let you do that. So that way, when you go to the listing appointment, you come prepared, you know exactly the condition of the property and you can hit the ground running. And it gives you an, um, an opportunity to identify them. Again, witness potential. If someone's going to victimize you, there's no way they're going to meet you in your office. There's no way they're going to come on camera. There's no way they're going to meet you in a public place if they have ill intentions. So I'll keep that in mind. And then I'll talk to you a little bit about that coffee house because the coffee house is not the be all end all, especially if it's a busy one and they don't know you from Adam. So we'll talk about the witness potential. So in this situation, a first meeting would allow you to gauge the disposition of who you're meeting and also allow them to know that you have them on camera. That there are witnesses. Now, this is a story. When I first heard this story, it's like, is this a safety story? This real estate agent went to show a property. What he did not know is that the weekend before the property was burglarized and the neighbor was looking out of the window. She said, that's the same car. And that looks like the exact same guy who burglarized the property the week before. Of course it wasn't. So he is in the property. He had his client who happened to be black and his teenage son with him. So they look out the window and they're looking at the police presence. It's like, wow, someone's in trouble. They had no idea that the police were there for them. Most of you have seen the videos by now of him, all of three of them coming out with their hands up and then their hands cuffed behind their backs. He was finally able to convince them that he was a real estate agent. He had them pull the wallet out, their, his license. He was able to convince them that he was a real estate agent. So in this situation, the homeowner saw who she thought was a burglar about to burglarize the house. The police were responding because they thought that they were coming to the scene of a crime, right? My question to you, is what can you do that would prevent you from ever having the police called on you when showing? So if you can raise your hand and jump in. And another question is, has the police ever been called when you were working? My sister said that the only time the police has ever been called is when she triggered the alarm. She triggered the alarm, did not know the code. And so the alarm sounded, the police came. Has anyone here, can anyone here tell me what step you can take to ensure that no one calls the police on you. There are a few things you can do. I'm going to wait until a hand goes up and then have you jump in to tell me what you can do to make sure you are not in that situation. Is everyone shy on me or are you sleeping? Or no one has, okay, there's Pamela. Okay, Pamela, um, make sure you unmute and tell me what, what you think you can do to prevent that from happening to you. Well, I would think that if you were having an open house in an area that that could happen, 
you would want to maybe go to the neighbors and say, hi, introduce yourself. I'm having an open house next door. You're welcome to come over, give the business card. So they know who to expect. They know who you are. And the same thing with the owners of the house if they haven't met you. Um, introduce yourself. Excellent. excellent, excellent, excellent point. That's perfect for an open house. And that's what I advise. And I think we'll talk about that when you host an open house, make it a business development opportunity and a safety opportunity. Introduce yourself, hand out your business card, make sure they know who you are, and then it could be future business. But what about showing? He was simply showing the property. Is there anything that you can think that as an agent showing a property that you can do to make sure that no one thinks that you're doing something suspicious enough to have to call the police? Okay. Oh, Veronica. Yes. You could have one of those magnetic signs on your car. Exactly. That's where I'm going. Wrap your vehicle. If you're not the person who will wrap your entire vehicle, then have a magnetic sign on your car. And then here's another story I want to tell you. This is all about lessons learned and storytelling, right? I had an agent who said that she had the signs on the side of her car. You know how you can get your picture and your phone number, your logo on there. She was stalked. So she said, and it happened more than once that people would see her, maybe just sitting at a stoplight. They would look over, see her. There's her phone number right there. And then that led to stalking. So the workaround for that situation is the magnetic one. So when you pull up in front of the property, put the signs on the side of the car and remove them when you leave the property. Excellent, excellent point. And another thing I had an agent say when I pull up, she said, and I see someone out, I'm saying, hi, you know, I'm a real estate agent. I'm going to show the property today. How are you? I hear agents say have a name tag on so you can help relieve or, or reduce some of the questions as to who you are and why you're there. Excellent points. This is a story, the latest story about a real estate agent actually killed in the line of duty. And this happened uh, two or three years ago. This real estate agent during the pandemic sold a house sight unseen. He sold it to a, a buyer who was in his 80s, like mid 80s, about 84, 85 or so years old. So he bought the house sight unseen. When he got to the house, he decided that he didn't like it and he wanted to return it. He was upset. He was angry. So this real estate agent went to his property to talk to him and to explain to him how the real estate process worked. Unfortunately, he shot and killed the real estate agent and then he turned the gun on himself. In that situation, I was in, where were we? San Diego during the conference and afterwards, I had a friend of the agent come up to me and I said, how would you have recommended that that be different? What could have solved the problem? She said, first and foremost, never sell a house virtually without them stepping foot in it before you close. So that's not always possible, but that's how she thought the problem could be solved. My sister sold a million dollar property, sight unseen, they moved in all as well. So it's not a one one size fits all situation. So you need to gauge the situation based on your gut. This happened in Vegas. This was um, last year. Everything seemed so sudden. This was last year. This real estate agent was in the property. A guy came in and she was uncomfortable enough to lock him out. She locked herself in the cat in the closet and he's knocking on the windows. He eventually came in the house, came to the closet, drug her out. She was on the phone with someone. So she was able to get help there in a hurry. So the stories are everywhere. People always talk about crimes. I don't go out at night or only go to good neighborhoods. Most of these crimes are happening in broad daylight. Most of them are happening in model homes or upscale neighborhoods because frankly, that's where the good stuff is. So criminals are out there and you just need to be alert and aware at all times. This situation, squatters. If anyone here has ever been in a, uh, um, on a showing or a situation where there are squatters, that is a scary time. So depending upon if it's a foreclosure or a distressed property, you need to make sure that you check the perimeter first. There's a whole different way to show a foreclosed or distressed property than a regular residential property. And on the NAR website, I actually did a webinar on safety for distressed properties. You have to walk the perimeter first and make sure that it hasn't been breached, that the doors are locked, windows are locked. Otherwise, you need to be careful of the dangers that await you. Here's another story about a landlord and a tenant situation. That's a whole different ball game and it's a dangerous situation, especially when tenants are stressed and they don't know if they're going to lose their home or not. Another uh, eviction story and it's happening a lot. Earlier this year, there were two stories in the national news headlines about real estate agents being assaulted by fellow agents. 
two real estate companies had real estate agents claim and file lawsuits claiming that fellow agents attacked them. Now, there are two lessons for this story. And most of you all are aware of what's going on on a national level regarding the same topic. But the point is, if people, whether agents, male or female, feel uncomfortable and they stay quiet, then the next time you hear about it, it's going to be in a lawsuit and it's going to be splashed across the headlines. One of my passions, one of my expert areas of expertise is creating a safe and secure culture. Anyone here familiar with the concept of psychological safety? Can you raise your hand if you understand the concept of psychological safety, what it is and what it means and how it may play into this topic, whether dealing with these specific stories of the real estate company or just in general regarding harassment, sexual harassment or otherwise in the real estate industry? Anyone? The concept of psychological safety means that if you see something, you'll say something, you'll speak up. If something's happening to you, something's happening around you, if you witness something, you will speak up without fear of retribution, retaliation, or punishment. You know that leadership will listen to you, they will hear you, and they will act upon it. What happened in these situations is someone was being assaulted, someone was being harassed, and they did not feel comfortable going to leadership saying, this is happening. I don't know the reason. Maybe they thought they wouldn't be heard or maybe they just didn't want to chance it. But if the environment is a psychologically safe environment, they would speak up immediately and they would know that their concerns would be addressed. So that is something that I strongly believe in. And again, a whole new I have a whole separate class for that. Here's one of the most recent stories about an agent. This real estate agent happened to be in New Zealand. She was knocking doors, um, just door knocking in a neighborhood and she hasn't been seen since July. And then there was another real estate agent um, in Texas who was assaulted. So there are so many stories out there, and that was this summer. There are so many stories out there, and these are just the ones that we've heard of. Whenever I hear a story, the number one thing I wanna do is to make sure we are not blaming the victim, but let's take that and let's learn a lesson from it. So you're thinking those are just a whole lot going on, a whole lot of stories, and they are. But I, I believe in lessons learned. And someone said, you're just trying to scare us. It's like, that is not my goal. Think about this for a moment. If one of your neighbors had a, a burglary, someone broke into their house and they didn't tell you. And let's say the next day your house was burglarized and you talk to your neighbor, they say, oh yeah, there's a whole string of burglaries in the neighborhood. And wouldn't the first question you ask be, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't anyone tell me? Because if you know something, you'll do something different. You might buy a burglar system. You might finally get that lock fixed. That's the same thing I believe in the real estate world. When I share these stories, you'll say, yes, that can happen. So let me make sure that it doesn't happen. If anyone has any questions on anything um, that I've said so far, let me know. Um, I'm not able to see the chat. So Elsie, is there anything in there that I need to know or see before I move on to the next topic? Um, the only thing is, I'm not sure if you saw from Jeffrey Hallen, you said, um, I think it was when you were asking about what they can do to be safe. He said, meet your client at your office, have them sign a buyer's agreement before you show properties, have them show uh, their driver's license. Okay, and those are, okay, I see that now. Okay, those are excellent, excellent points. If not at your office, then at a lender's office, at a title company office, even your association, I guarantee you, your association will let you use an office, um, a conference room or space to meet your clients. So those are all excellent points. And the driver's license, that's what we've always said for years and years. And agents have pushed back on that somewhat. But nowadays, if you're not in the office, how quick and easy is it to take a picture of their license? But you have to explain that this is our safety protocols. I have to have a picture of your driver's license so that my office knows who I'm working with. But when we're done, we have the document destruction and it will be secure and we will destroy it. So you need to let them know the next step. So thank you so much for jumping in, Jeffrey. So here's one thing that I do. I Oh, Jim has his hand raised. Yes, Jim. Uh oh, we can't hear you if you're talking. You have to unmute. Okay. There you go. I try to have people meet me in the office, especially buyers. I tell them that well, until I get to know you, it's going to take me probably three weeks showing you properties before we are aligned in what you're looking for. 
So please, I'd like to meet you in the office for about a half hour before we start out. Then it'll save us about three weeks of chasing around. And they go, oh, okay. So it's worth them doing it. Also, uh, with regards to the driver's license, so that, first of all, meeting in the office is good that way. And it's beneficial. Um, but uh, when people are showing uh, cars at car dealerships, they are, they do get a copy of the driver's license and they go and they make a photocopy of it. So that's protocol in the selling cars. And um, so I think that it's since it's protocol in selling cars, it should be protocol and should be pretty easy to do as far as showing houses to um, to potential clients. So whether it be uh, sellers or buyers or what have you. So I think okay, the two excellent. go hand in hand and I think are very, very um, uh, important. I agree with you. And that is bordering on brilliance. Two things. Um, when you say, you know, it'll save us time, that's the productivity part of it. If you say that, you know, we can, I can get to know you better, show you some properties before we head out, you know, on online or whatever, you're telling them and just what you're doing, here's how I'm going to make it easier for you. And then you said it right up front. I don't know you yet. So anyone can imagine that this is a stranger. And then this is what this person, and I'm glad that you are a male agent saying that because it does impact male agents as well. So oh, yes. I had an um, an agent who said that she was going to show a couple. And she said, you know, she had the appointment set up. They were going to show after work. And then she started thinking, it's like, I don't know these people. So what she did is she called and she said, look, can we, can you just come to my office first? And then we'll go look at properties. And then he said, what? You know, why can't we just go to the property? She said, it'll be easier. Come to my office. I'll get some information. Then we'll go look at properties. He said, that's crazy. We have to drive by the house to come to your office. It doesn't make sense. You know, what are you talking about? She said, look, I don't know you from Adam. This is for my safety. If I were your mom, your wife, your sister, your daughter, wouldn't you want me to do the, wouldn't you want them to do the same? After that, no problem. So just the way you presented it, Jim, excellent point. And then you also said it's protocol in the auto sales business. You are not test driving a car without giving them your license. There's no if, ands, or buts about it. Even looking at an apartment, you're not going to look at a model apartment until you stop by the leasing office first and show your license. So that should not be a barrier. People should be accustomed at this point. So excellent point. Um, there should be no way anyone would push back on giving a driver's license to see possibly the biggest investment of their lives, especially if you think about we used to just hand over our driver's license at Blockbuster, right? We didn't think twice about who was behind the counter. Now, let's talk a little bit about can being a safety trained real estate agent help you grow your business? And the answer is yes, it can help you grow your business. And before I go forward, um, Elsie did say that the um, that the OC Realtors would allow you to meet clients at either of their offices, and you can even rent out a room as well. So thank you for that. Your your association has your back. So now let's talk about ways that you can be an expert. How to lead with safety. All these articles, I'm going to give you a link at the end, so don't worry about it. Number one. Who here has ever picked up a hitchhiker? There's always someone, at least one person in each class. So someone here has picked up a hitchhiker, typically back in what I call the olden days. If I ask if you would pick up a hitchhiker right now, you would look at me like I had two heads. Most people would never dream of doing it, although um, I get to speak all over. And last year, I was in two different cities. They were in rural areas. And people in the class say, yes, we would pick up hitchhikers without hesitation. Um, and it's like, why? Why? Explain it to me. And one said, um, hey, I was down on my luck at one point, And I just figured if they're down on their luck, I want to help them because I've been where they are. And another one said, well, if it's just a uh, lady or woman, you know, that's relatively harmless. So people often think that if it's a woman, that you don't have to worry about it, you know, they're safe. Or you think if it's a couple you know, hey, I'm sure they're good. I always ask, ask the question, you guys remember Bonnie and Clyde? Yeah. So criminals come in both genders and you can't just let your guard down. So then hitchhikers, most of you would never dream of doing. 
How many of you would meet a complete stranger at an empty house that you didn't know? Everybody should raise your hand because you have all done it. We've all done it. You've gotten a phone call, met a complete stranger in that empty house and took your chances. Then the question is, what's the difference? What's the difference between picking up a hitchhiker on the side of the road and being in a car with them and meeting a complete stranger in an empty house? One easy difference, money, commission, the possibility of making money means that you're willing to do one dangerous act over the other. I'm here to say you should not do that. So if you wouldn't pick up a hitchhiker, then you should not meet a complete stranger at an empty house. Now, what about riding in the car with clients? That's not a hard yes or no. Who here has ever driven a client around in your vehicle and you would do it nowadays? And if so, tell us what you do to be safe while doing so. Anyone here? Raise your hand, let us know if you've ever, if you currently drive your clients around with you in your vehicle. Anyone? So seeing no hands, I'm going to assume no. Now my sister happens to work with the university here. And when they are moving people into town, hiring um, people, now she's the one who has to pick them up at the airport, pick them up at the hotel and show them around. So she has them in the car, she's tour guide. So the question there is, what do you do to stay safe? First and foremost, they're vetted. Someone knows who they are, so they're not complete strangers. She's done her homework, and the fact that the university says this is someone we're hiring, so that removes the danger there. Although something could still happen, but it's less likely. In situations where you're saying, I just need to be able to be in the same car with them to get to know them and we can build loyalty and trust, this is, again, where you have to know them first. And that's what Veronica is saying. Um, you need to get them know, to know them first. Before they get in your car, you need to know who they are do your homework and vet them. I'm going to talk about some tools that are available. And I, I don't know if your organization is familiar with Forewarn. Elsie, can you let me know if, um, just in the chat, if you all subscribe to Forewarn, because that's a tool that can help remove some of the dangers. Okay. Here's an area that I am adamant that you must listen to me. Okay, Elsie says she's not familiar with forewarn. I'm gonna talk about it at the end and you all can determine if that is something that would be a fit for you as a tool in your safety toolbox. Do not judge a book by its cover. How many times have I heard an agent say, oh, I'm a good judge of character. Oh, I can look somewhere, but I can give them the good up and down and determine whether or not they mean me harm. Oh, I can tell. I can always just tell. I'm here to say that no, you can't. You cannot judge a book by its cover. You're not good at it. None of us are. I used to ask the question that, well, what is the physical characteristic of someone that makes you uncomfortable? Who do you not want to see walking into your open house? Who do you not want to see in a dark alley or passing on the sidewalk at night? Who do you not want to see get out of the car before your, your appointment? Get out of the car coming towards you. Every single one of us, has a preconceived notion of who means us danger. I'm here today to erase that preconceived notion. I'm doing that that will keep in a way that will keep you safe. You can never judge a book by its cover. So if you think you can, stop it. <laughs> stop right now. Let's play a game, shall we? Take a look at this picture. Let's say you're the agent that does high, high uh, upscale listing the luxury properties and you can look and see people as they pull up to your property and you get to make a judgment. I want someone to tell me who this is. So you're the upscale real estate agent. You're the one who's a good judge of character, this luxury listing, and you see him pull up. And you are going to make a judgment about whether or not he could afford the upscale listing that you are hosting or your listing. Anyone know who that is? I don't see anything in the chat. I don't see any hands up. So I'm going to tell you. That's Sam Walton, the founder of Walmart, one of the richest men in the world. That's how he showed up around town. That's the truck that he drove. So if he pulled up to your listing and you said, uh -uh, you can't afford what I have, it would cost you business, right? Let's play a game again. Take a look at this face. I bet you all know who this is. No matter what, people always know who he is. Can someone tell me who this is? 
either put it in the chat or raise your hand. Exactly, Veronica. Ted Bundy, notorious serial killer. How do people describe him? Charming, clean cut, good looking, charismatic, charismatic, right? He would go to parking lots where women would be shopping and he would have a cast, a fake cast on or crutch or something. And he would ask for help. Women would look at him, oh, he's harmless or he's kind of good looking. They judge that book by its cover and it cost them their lives. You can't judge a book by its cover. So you're saying, hey, Tracy, what are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to know whether or not we're safe? Take a look at this cutie pie. This picture could be someone's mom, you know, from back in the olden days. This could be a neighbor, just regular people. All of these women are serial killers. You would not know it by looking at them. If, if you haven't gotten the message yet, hear me. And if you hear nothing else, listen to this. You can't judge a book by its cover. So you're saying, how, how are we supposed to know if someone means us harm? Every animal in nature has a built-in survival mechanism that is hardly ever wrong. Either in the chat or raise your hand. Tell me what all of us possesses that could keep us from ever being victimized if we only respected it, if we only listened to it. Ah, Veronica said that's one of my favorite books. Veronica, look on my bookshelf. I have a copy, two, three copies of it here. Kevin D. Becker, um, The Gift of Fear. Instinct. Gut. Intuition. Sixth Sense. Flight or Flight. If you all know Carl Carter Jr., Beverly Carter's son, he calls it Spidey Sense. Every animal in nature has it, and its sole job is to keep us safe. It has no other agenda it has no other job except to warn us when we are in danger. And so often we ignore it. We ignore that voice when our, do we get a funny feeling in the pit of our stomach? Our heart starts beating fast. The hairs are standing up on the back of our arms. Our body is warning us you are in danger. And yet yeah, the hairs on the back of your neck, you're in danger. Get out of the situation. And we brush it off and ignore it. No other animal in nature does it except human beings. Hear this. When you get that voice, get out of the situation. Here's another lesson learned. Here's another one of my stories. Two veteran agents have been in the business over 20 years. One agent was going to show doctors properties in the rich part of town that afternoon where the mansions are, right? The other agent was on board duty and I'm probably dating myself. Other agent on board duty, you know, she said, let me know when my client gets here at the office. So the agent on board duty sees a doctor coming in. He's got on his lab coat and everything. She went back and she said, hey, your client's here. She said, but there's something wrong. She said, what are you talking about? She said, I've got a bad feeling. How well do you know him? She said, I don't know him. You know, this is my first time meeting him. She said, you've got to postpone this meeting. Check him out first, postpone it, and then meet him. She said, that's silly. I'm going to go show him houses this afternoon. I'll see you later. So later on that, she goes to show him houses. Later on that evening, she gets a phone call from the doctor. And she's talking to him and the doctor is saying, wait a minute, what are you talking about? This is a strange conversation. She said, what are you talking about? He said, you're talking as if we've met. He, she said, we did meet. I showed you houses all afternoon. What are you talking about? You, know, you had on your lab coat, your name tag, and we looked at houses all afternoon. He said, someone broke into my office and they stole my lab coat. It wasn't me. She went back to the other agent. She said, what did you see that I missed? The other agent said at the time, I didn't know what it was. I couldn't put my finger on it. She said, all I know is that I had a bad feeling. She said, but after you left, I realized that he had on his lab coat. How many of you all have ever seen a doctor in a grocery store with his lab coat on? It doesn't happen, right? What about at the gas station pumping gas with his lab coat on? It does not happen. She said, and then the final thing was when he asked for you, he put his hand on the counter. His fingernails were absolutely filthy. How many of you have ever seen a doctor with filthy fingernails? It doesn't happen. Moral of the story, the lesson learned there, because if your gut is telling you that there's danger, don't try to use logic. Don't try to reason. Listen to it. Get out of the situation. Make up an excuse. Make up a story, whatever you have to do, and then check things out. And if you have to come back, you can e either explain it, give an excuse, or apologize. But that's a voice that should never be ignored. It's never wrong. And then Veronica says she saw my book on the bookshelf. 
I mean, that's my go-to reading, no matter what. It's the best gift you could ever give anyone. It should be required reading. Okay, let's talk about having a safety plan. Everybody needs a safety plan. Just like any other job has a job description, you need a safety plan. According to that residential safety report, the agents said that 66% of the time they had a pre-meeting. That number seems a little bit high to me, but if it's true, then yay, good for you. Again, your office, your OC, Realtors office, either office location will allow you to do so. No need ever to just have a meeting. I remember during the pandemic, after things started to open up again, everybody, so-called experts were saying, meet at the coffee shop. If you, the whole point of a first meeting is to increase witness potential. If you go to a coffee shop, they're super busy, they don't know you, you're not, you're not accomplishing the goal. There maybe will be perpetrator, maybe buyer, no, so no one's paying attention to you. They cannot identify you or them. So if you go to a coffee shop, make it one where they know you. They know you by name. Or again, go to one of your trusted uh, partner's offices. What about that virtual first meeting? We talked about that. That is the safest way to do it and the most productive way. You can even start showing buyers properties online before you get into the car and waste gas going to see them. So yes, you can make it more productive. Let's talk a little bit about the dress code. This is men and women. Female agents love to wear the high heel shoes sometimes. My sister is one of them. Keep in mind, they look good on, but they are hard to run in. So if you're in a situation in a property and you just can't, and you need to get away, hard to do. I just saw something online yesterday where someone was observing a, observing a real estate agent show up who was putting signs down. She had on stilettos and she was walking across the yard trying to put the signs down. Her heels were going in, but all the same, it's not always practical to have on heels. My, my goal is that you should be able to run and escape when and if necessary. Can't do it or hard to do in high heel shoes. Although I was in Knoxville, Tennessee, when I had an agent pull off her stiletto, hold it in the air and say, I will use it as a weapon. I believe her. Uh, but most of us can't do that. So shoes that you can run in. Sad to say, but that's our reality. You have to say what's true. Fancy, expensive jewelry, save it for special occasions. And that means men, that means women, that means your handbags, that means any device, anything of value, save it for special occasions. Okay, again, articles that can help you um, work in a safer manner. You can read those on your own and you can share them. I will share the link with you. There is a um, seven boxes on this screen. I'd like you to look at each name. And then I'm going to turn the page. I want you to look at each name here. And I want someone to tell me, what do you notice about the names on the screen? Either put it in the chat or raise your hand. Veronica is all over this. They're all males. Every single one of these agents are males. Um, we do the storytelling, so let me do it quickly. I want to make sure I get through everything today, and I have a lot of information to cover. I talk kind of fast. If I am going too fast, you can put it in the chat and ask me to slow down because I typically have like three hours to do a program. Sometimes I have a whole day. I did a whole eight hour day in Montana and I still ran out of time. So I'm always trying to get the information. And if I'm going too fast, please just let me know I need to slow down. All of these are males. David Abbasi was a real estate agent in Atlanta during safety month who was killed while he was previewing properties. Ryan Vega, an agent in Las Vegas, who met a client and he was stabbed in the neck. He survived also during safety month of the same year. And you all know that Beverly Carter was killed, kidnapped during safety month. Don't get that. Um, Sidney Cranston Jr.'s body was found after he was missing for 18 months. Lane Gamble, a real estate agent in North Carolina, sitting in front of a property who had a gun put to his head. Um, this real estate agent was in Washington, and the story about him is that he took his wife with him. He took someone with him when he was showing a property. The problem is his wife was sitting in the car waiting, oblivious to anything that was going on in the house. He went into the property, which he had shown before. The doors were closed in the hallway, and he thought that was weird. You know, bedroom doors are all closed. All of a sudden, the doors opened up, and he was physically accosted or assaulted by, I want to say, two to three people but his wife was in the car. So if you're going to have someone with you, it doesn't have to be a big, strong male. It doesn't have to be a male at all. 
just another person because there is truly safety in numbers. And again, you don't hear um, stories about crimes against two agents, but they have to be alert and aware. So they can tag along. You can make sure that they don't get involved in real estate business because they're not licensed, but they can tag along unless they're licensed. So just truly safety in numbers. Frank Wayman was a real estate, is a real estate broker in a small town in Missouri who let someone in his office and then he had a machete pulled on him. And then David is the first story that I showed you all, um, the agent who was killed. Mickey's the agent in Nebraska who was killed and stepped into the crawl space. Stefan, Stefano Barbosa was an agent leaving a property. There was a sign in New York. He was leaving the property when a teenager approached him with a gun, said, get in the car. We're going for a ride. He took him to two ATMs and he got $500 from each machine and he killed them after taking the $1,000. Um, the real estate agent, John Doe, is the one who said, um, who threw his keys, who had to make a decision, fight or flight. And then Christopher Hager is the one who sold the property unseen. The most recent stories about real estate agents in the past three or so years, the ones that have made the headline, many of them have been male agents. So for the male agents who are here, thank you for being here. This is not a female agent situation, not a female agent problem. I'm going to give you the link at the end so that you can find all of these articles. I wrote another article for RIS Media about male agents and then also was interviewed by Inman. This is a thing. It's a big deal. So if you know male agents who don't think that they need to worry, tap them on the shoulder, share the articles with them so that they can be alert and aware. Because so often when I was interviewing them, I said, why do you not worry about safety? And one of them said, um, you know, I'm 6'2", 225 pounds. You know, I don't have to worry about it. How many times have I heard agents tell me they're weighting their height? as if that makes a difference. And the one agent who was assaulted while his wife was in the car, his story is on the Realtor, the NAR Realtor website. Watch his story. He said, I'm a big guy. I never saw it coming and never thought it would happen to me. One agent said, it's that machismo thing. You know, we're macho, nothing's going to happen to us. And another agent said, look, we're just stupid. I don't think they're stupid, but I just think that everyone needs to be alert and aware. And if you know the stories are happening, then you're more likely to understand. Are there any questions? I feel like I'm talking a mile a minute. Um, any other questions? <clears throat> and then typically, since we're virtual, I don't think we need to take a break because you can pop off and take a break and they come back to us. So I think we're good there. Um, so if there are no other questions, I'm going to keep on going. As a real estate agent, there someone should know where you are at all times. There should never be a time where your whereabouts are unknown. You should never pop up and go on an appointment without checking in or telling someone that should never happen. And as a matter of fact, that's something I even said to when my daughter was growing up, I need to know where you are at all times. And she would check in. My sister says, how do you know she's really where she said she is? It's a whole different conversation. But in the real estate world, there should never be a time where someone doesn't know where you are and who you're with. And think about how easy it is. You text probably a million times a day. We all do. How hard would it be to send a text to someone saying, hey, I'm about to go show a client from one to three. You know, here's who I'm showing. Just quick and easy. And that way they know I'm going to talk to you about a technology tool that can make that even more safer. Um, she said this, uh, Veronica's asking about that safety jewelry. Um, I think it's called Invisalware. And what that does is it allows you to push a button and it sends a message. And if you're in a dangerous situation, it sends a signal to your contact, your emergency contact list. And then they know, hey, you're in danger. Here's your GPS location. The problem, but then I, if I'm not mistaken, and I just looked this up the other day, I did have an opportunity to meet the owner at one of the NAR conferences is that they have partnered with, um, what is that? ADT. And they had a live option. I need to make sure they still have that. If they have a live option, then that is great. The problem I have with a lot of the safety apps and not just the jewelry, but any other safety app is if you push a button when you're in danger, all you're doing is sending your location to the crime scene. You're saying, I'm in danger, something's about to happen, help me. And then you're sending it out. And then whoever gets it, if their phone is in the bottom of their purse or they're in, out in the yard and their phone's inside, help is not coming. But even if help is, help is coming, then they're simply coming to your location and it's more than likely to be too late. But I do believe that that uh, jewelry company had a live feature. So if you have an app, it must have a live feature. It must have 
a way for you to open up the line and talk to someone where you can say, hey, I'm in danger. And they hear the conversation and they can get help to you before it really gets bad. So uh, thank you for bringing that up. I'm also going to talk to you about a tool that you already have right now, probably in your hands on your phone. If you like a piece of paper, um, so many agents uh, want to form a piece of paper in hand, then the w Realtor website has a form, an agent, an agent information form, a client itinerary form, where you can um, have them fill out the form. There's a blank spot on there where they can put their a copy of their driver's license and it gets basic information. The form is perfectly fine. The one form that I don't think gets enough attention is the agent information form. That is the form that you tell your broker, manager, or owner, here are any medical issues, here's any allergies, anything that could happen to me, any medical crisis. Um, I had an, a broker in Oklahoma City say that she had an agent who was diabetic. And when he passed out in her office, she immediately knew what the problem was. So she was able to take action right then and there and get him the proper kind of help to save him. One thing that form also has is your emergency contact. Does your broker, manager, owner know who to call if you're in a dangerous situation or if something is wrong health-wise? You also need to have the make, model, color of your vehicle on there. If something happens to you and law enforcement officials ask your broker, hey, what kind of vehicle does your agent drive? They need to know. So that's a form that needs to be completed up on hire. And then every six months, it needs to be updated. I just don't see that happening a lot. But that is so important in this industry, especially if and when something goes wrong. You'll have a link to everything. Now, this is an area that's even getting more and more important. I'll bet everyone here, either you have or you know someone who is who has gotten improper phone calls or texts. On two occasions, my sister said, look at these pictures that I've gotten completely inappropriate pictures that she got by text. Um, and it's happening to a lot of agents. In Houston, let's talk about this lesson learned. Real estate agent had a phone call with a new buyer, a new client. Everything started out okay, professional, and then it took a turn to personal. And then she's like, I'm not comfortable with the way you're talking to me. You know, it's inappropriate. And then she said, at this point, you know, I'm going to, he said, I'm, I'm going to rape you. He said, no more, no more. I'm not talking to you anymore. You deal with my husband. And then he said, I'm going to kill him. So it escalated. After that, she went to her broker. She went to law enforcement. It turns out that over the past decade, over 100 agents in Houston had received the same kind of call. We don't know if it was the same person or if it's just a similar kind of call. The lesson learned in a situation, if you get a harassing phone call, so often uh, people say, I'll just block them and that'll solve the problem and I'll go about my business. That's not the answer. Who can tell me what else you should do and why? If you get a harassing phone calls or inappropriate te text, who can jump in and tell me what the ideal situation, the way to handle that would be? Not only for your safety, but for your fellow agents. Anyone? Either chat or unmute, please. Okay, I'm jumping in. You need to report it. Report it. If you block it and you move on, that doesn't solve the problem. So here's a way you can look out for your fellow agents. In her situation, because she reported, law enforcement officials knew that there was a pattern and they knew that this person could possibly still be out there. They were able to issue a warning to all real estate agents to be careful and here's what to do. So report it. Report it to your real estate company. They in turn will report it to the association. I've seen people on Facebook say, we're going to blast this guy or this girl, whoever it is. We're going to blast them and, you know, put them out there. Don't do that. You cannot do that. You cannot publish their name, their information because of liability issues. The National Association of Realtors has a proper procedure in place and your association knows what that procedure is. Before you can publish any information with anyone's name, follow the steps. The number one step is to go to the police and file a report. Um, some people think, oh, it's not a big deal. It's not a crime. That's not your job to determine. Let police, let the police department tell you whether or not it's a crime that needs to be addressed. Not your job. You can't make that call. And then once you tell them, if they agree, then they will file a police report. Once they file a police report, then you can tell the world 
share that report number and whatever is contained within that report, you can say, because are they going to sue the police? The police have done their jobs. You just can't do it because you don't want to get sued if you defame or libel, libel someone who's maybe innocent. We don't know. So follow the proper procedures. Report, report, report. And yes, you're right, Kui. Um, blocking is an option. You simply must block and then take the other steps. Now, a lot of uh, real estate agents who were surveyed said that they have been on the receiving end of inappropriate text messages or phone calls. Report it and as well as block it. Now, I talk about an anonymous phone number, a secure phone number, a cloud-based phone number. And I remember an agent saying, I can't do that. I've got to get the phone calls. That's how I stay in business. An anonymous number is like a Google number, a Google cloud number. Does anyone here have a Google number? If you do, either unmute or put it in chat. If you have a Google number, it's still going to ring to your phone. The difference is that it doesn't connect directly to you, your personal information, or your account. I'm going to talk about the Forewarn app. What the Forewarn app does is if you have a new client that you've never met before and you want to check them out, do a criminal check, you're going to enter their phone number into the app. And then in about a minute or two, you're going to get back a crime report. If they've ever had any convictions, any crimes, you're going to get a financial report back, whether or not they have um, bankruptcies or any financial situation that may stop them from buying a house. You're going to get confirmation of their identity. Is this a permanent phone or is this a temporary burner throwaway phone? That information is going to come to you. But <clears throat> having a secure phone number means that it's a cloud number. It is not tied to your information. So if someone tries to Google you or look you up by number, it's not connected to you. It's on a server in the cloud. So for a real estate agent, a secure phone number is ideal because you can't be tracked or traced with that number and it still rings to your phone. We're going to talk a little bit about scam calls. Um, scam calls are off the charts. During the pandemic, they spiked. Um, if you, Almost all of us know someone who has gotten a spam call or you've been on the receiving end of a spam call. So you need to be careful. Um, they're more than likely going to text you or they're going to give you a phone call. I'm going to talk to you in a bit when we wrap up about how cyber criminals are using artificial intelligence in order to amplify the scam calls as well as the scam texts. Um, Okay, the name of the company, Sharon, is Forewarn, F-O-R-E-W-A-R-N. And you might just double check to see if your company offers it as a benefit there. Um, and they're on the NAR website. So you can take a look there. And I'll talk about it a little bit later. So we already talked about that first meeting, meeting in a populated place. Now let's talk about how you can make more money by being the agent who leads with safety. I'm about to give you some tools and tips and practices dealing with sellers, dealing with bisbos, and even dealing with buyers. So let's talk about it. When you go to a seller listing appointment, you're probably the but third or so agent that they've interviewed, right? So my question to you, and here's one, I'd like to see it in the chat or raise your hand. What do you do to stand out from all of the other agents that have been interviewed on a listing appointment? What is special about you when you have a listing appointment that you can convince the seller to hire you. Can anyone tell me what's different and what's special about you? I didn't expect an answer. And I had an agent said, I'm not telling everyone. So I didn't expect an answer on that question. So let me tell you going forward, what's going to be different about you, what you're going to do that will make sure that you get that call back, that you get the listing, what gives you an edge? You're going to walk in with a security checklist, a security sheet that's a safety and security checklist. You'll walk in and instead of talking to them about CMAs and net proceeds and how much money they're going to make and the marketing and open houses, you're saying, before we even get started, I want to walk through the house with you and talk to you about ways to keep your house secure while it's on the market, how to keep your family safe while it's on the market. You immediately have their attention, right? You have this sheet, this PDF, and I've created it for you. Um, again, I'm going to give you a link for these free PDF downloads. You walk in with the security checklist and you're going to say, let's get started. First of all, all of these pictures, family pictures, they have to go. No personal pictures in the property. 
I don't know who's going to be here, so I can't guarantee that whoever's here won't see pictures of your family that they shouldn't see. Pictures have to go. You're going to talk to them about getting jewelry out of jewelry boxes. Um, someone mentioned how Barbara Corcoran sometimes talks about safety. She said something brilliant. So you're telling the client to get jewelry out of jewelry boxes, but don't leave an empty jewelry box behind. Who can tell me why not? What does it mean if the maybe will be perpetrator, criminal burglar, sees an empty jewelry box? What's going to happen? Um, Sophia said they know they have some. Also, if they see it, they know there's jewelry somewhere, right? And right, Veronica, it's hidden somewhere else. Exactly. So what Barbara Corcoran said, and you all know Barbara Corcoran from Shark Tank um, and the Corcoran Real Estate Company, one of the most famous real estate agents in the world, who took, was it, $1,400 and turned it into a $60 million real estate company? Which she, and she's really sharp. What she said is put some cheap costume jewelry in the jewelry box. Just put it in there. And then that way they think, oh, maybe they just have bad taste in jewelry. But they're not running around looking for the jewelry, right? Prescription medicine out of medicine cabinets. There's a big black market for prescription medication. You want to make sure that that's not a, a temptation. You're telling them all of these stacks of mail and paperwork that I see here needs to go away. Not just aesthetically, but what if they have financial papers, bank um, records, receipts, bills, medical bills? They can, it can open them up for identity theft. So you need to tell them all paperwork, mail, all of it out of sight. Talk to them about lighting, locks, and landscaping. Not just from the aesthetic point, you explain to them that these overgrown bushes and trees could provide a hiding place for the criminals. Tell them that they need to have the right kind of locks and the doors need to actually be locked. You need to talk to them about, about lighting, why it's important to have good lighting front and back, especially at night, um, that is going to keep their house from being burglarized. Now you're thinking all of that is not necessarily my concern, but it is. Think about the mindset of the seller who you're talking to when they hear you taking the time to tell them how to keep their house safe and secure and their family safe while it's on the market. I guarantee you no other real estate agent is having that conversation with them. So you're the one telling them, here's how you keep your house safe. You talk to them about what to do if someone knocks on the door and wants to show the property. Here's the deal. I guarantee you right now, if you have a listing and you have a seller who really wants to sell, if someone knocks on their door today and says, I'm a real estate agent, here's my card. These are my clients. We'd like to look at your house. I guarantee you they'll let them in. What's the problem with that? What if they're not really real estate agents? I can print up business cards, right? I can even put a print up a little name tag saying I'm a real estate agent. I can buy a magnet to put on the side of my car saying I'm an agent and pull up in front of someone's house. You need to be the real estate agent having a conversation with your seller saying, if someone shows up, you're never to let anyone in your house. So here's my question to you. What do you tell them to do if someone shows up on their front porch and they want to see the house and the seller opens the door? What do you tell your seller to do? And again, this is a conversation you're having at the listing appointment after you walk through. You're sitting down and you're telling them, you know, let's make sure we do this in a safe manner. Veronica says, call me. Jim has his hand up. Yes, Jim. Use the electronic lockbox. Always use that. Never use a regular combo, but use the electronic lockbox because that is going to, um, that's assigned to each individual agent. And it's going to um, uh, mark who came in the house to see. Excellent, excellent point. You are to tell your sellers, never allow anyone in the house, close and lock the door and tell them to utilize the lockbox. If they're a real real estate agent, they're going to open the door as soon as you leave and they're coming through the house so you will not lose the cell. And as you said, it will track who is there. So excellent point. And then Veronica said to call me. If you're the agent who says, call me, you need to be the agent who answers your phone. You need to be the agent who returns phone calls quickly because if you don't, they're going to think I'm not letting a live one get away. So excellent points. Thank you both. You need to lock up at the end and make sure your clients get valuables out of sight. And somewhere buried in that listing agreement, it says that I am not responsible or a real estate company is not responsible if anything is stolen. 
if you have a face-to-face -face conversation with your client, telling them to get valuables out of sight, the little electronic devices that kids leave that are scattered throughout the house, you're telling them get all of that stuff, your cameras, your extra phones, your laptops, all of that, keys, everything out of sight. That way, and, and jewelry, um, artwork, expensive artwork, and weapons, guns, get those under lock and key storage or get them all off, out of sight. That way, you will not get a phone call after an open house or after a showing say, you let someone steal my stuff. You've told them. If you're hosting someone else's open house, same thing. Walk through, make sure valuables are out of sight so that you do not get that phone call. I wrote an article. And again, you'll have the tips on how to use that that home seller checklist that I created for you. Real estate agents often have the conversation about whether or not they'll go in an attic, whether or not they'll go in a basement. So often they say, we're just not doing it. The question is, what if it's a finished loft and you need to show them the electronics in the smart home? What if it's a man cave or fancy basement and you need to show that information? So sometimes you may have to go into a loft or basement space. The key is to always lead. There should never, I'm sorry, let your client lead. There should never ever be a time where your client blocks your emergency exit, whether it's the front door, the back door, whatever it is, nothing should ever come between you and your emergency escape route. So always lead the way and that goes into for basements and attics. The seller, we just talked about ways to make sure they show safely. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about this topic. And um, I remember having a broker say, Tracy, don't waste your time telling agents not to use their pictures on their business cards. They're going to do it no matter what you say. My sister, my twin sister does it. So our picture is on her business card. Uh, we live in Kansas City. It's on her Kansas City Royals baseball schedules, her chief schedules, the calendars that she mails out. So my question was, Stacy. Why do you have your picture on your business card? Is it going to help you get more listings? Is it going to help you sell more houses? Her answer was, I am my business. When I talk to real estate agents across the country, they're all saying the branding marketing thing, we need to make sure people know who we are. We want to be recognized in the grocery store. So what I've learned is that you are going to use your pictures. I have one little bitty favor. Make it a professional picture, please. A professional headshot is good enough. I have seen some things. You need to be very careful. I see on social media, people are trying out um, pictures to see what people think about what's a good picture for our website. I've seen some things. Now the Google Plus group is no longer around, but there were some things on that group pictures that I couldn't show you because I don't want to get banned virtually from OC, right? There are pictures, things that agents would say and do. This real estate agent, one of these days I'm going to, and she may be here, uh, one of these days I'm going to run into someone that I have on the screen, but these are newspaper articles, so it's public information, so I should be okay. She said that she will do whatever it takes to make the phone ring. You know, she get, she went from 2,000 visits to 20,000 visits um, on her websites, and I don't know if this is anywhere close to where you all are, or you may know her, but this was an article in the paper. This real estate agent also decided he said, you have to look at creative ways these days, even if it means pimping yourself out. He's saying whatever it takes to make the phone ring. This real estate agent drew a lot of fire. I think this was last year. Um, I saw at least two or three newspaper articles about it. He said, Phil, female agents use their sex appeals. Why can't male agents? So he got a lot of heat from that. It's like, what about just focusing on your abilities? But he's saying whatever it takes to make the phone ring. Another part of a point that you need to consider is if he's the agent who's leading with sex, with his sexiness, um, or if there's a female agent leading with her sexiness, think about the couple that you're working with and how comfortable you're going to make them if one of them has to show up with the sexy agent and if they would be comfortable doing it. So it could impact your business in more ways than one, as well as you're putting yourself out there in a non-professional way. And we will never, ever blame a victim. No one can ever say she asked for it or he asked for it. That's not the way we do it. No one asked to be victimized. But I'm just saying to project a professional image, how you project yourself is how you will be treated. Um, we did not talk about taking pictures of license plates or actual pictures of clients. So if you show up at a listing 
have someone and meeting someone that you've never met before, are you comfortable saying, I need to take your picture and send this to my office? Most agents that I talked to said, never, they would never do that. Um, pictures of driver's licenses, that's more likely as long as you explain that you're not going to hold that information. You have someone's driver's license on your phone. And if you're not the agent who has a pen on your phone or who protects their phone, then you are jeopardizing them even further. So that is a tricky situation unless you have safety protocols in place and you explain it to the consumer. Now, one thing you can do is you can take a picture of the vehicle, maybe the license plate, and you can discreetly take a picture of them. I've had agents who said, I, I just needed to do that. So you have that picture of the person you're meeting, their vehicle, the license plate on your phone. It does you no good. The next step would be to send it to someone who knows where you are. That way, if something's wrong, they have that information to share with law enforcement officials. So having a safety plan is multifaceted. Um, faceted. There I go. Reading a word, but not pronouncing it right. You know what I mean? So you need to make sure that you have a plan in place and that you've thought it through, which is one of the values that I, I get to bring is I get to talk to agents um, during the, the training, make you think about this and to let you know that you have to have a plan in place. Flying by the seat of your pants and we'll figure it out when we get there. That doesn't work. When we're talking about advertising a property, there are certain words that you should not use because it's going to attract a criminal. Who can tell me what uh, uh, some of those descriptions, some of those words are that you should not use in your description of properties? Anyone? You can either put it in the chat, oh, vacant, thank you, Veronica. Anyone else have any other words that is a, a signal to maybe would be criminals? Bacon, it could be isolated, um, secluded. Thank you, Veronica. Any of those words, because the criminal's thinking and people, if you listen, more and more experts are saying crimes against agents are predatory in nature. It's not like they just happened upon someone and then they see you there and then, oh, I think I'm going to victimize this agent. The crimes are predatory. So they've already decided you're going to be their victim. They've already done their homework on you. They know who you are. They know where you're going to be. They know where to find you. They know everything they need to know about you. So those crimes are predatory. So if you are not careful and you're telling them, hey, I'm going to be at this secluded property, this isolated property at this time of day, whether it's an open house or not, you're telling the victim, or I'm sorry, the criminal, all the information they need to target you. So don't use those words in listings. Let's talk a little bit about open house safety. Now, so often I hear agents say, we don't do open houses anymore. We will not do an open house. I know the statistics say that open houses don't necessarily sell a listing, but you use open houses for business development. That's how you get buyers, maybe even listings, right? So it's a necessary evil in some situations. So the question is, how do we remove some of the danger from those open houses? One of the first things you do, and someone already said it, is when you're hosting an open house, go to the neighbors on either side across the street, introduce yourself, hand your business card and say, hey, I'm going to be here from whatever time to whatever time. You're welcome to come over and take a look at the house. So you've invited them. Whenever a sign goes up, people want to see the house. They just don't want to bother the agent and they definitely don't want to intrude upon the sellers, their neighbors. So you are inviting them to come over and take a look at the house. While they're there, that's less time that you're there alone or that's another person there with you and you're the new agent or whoever is accompanying your spouse or a friend. It's also a great business development tool. If they need to sell their house, they know you know the neighborhood, they've met you, they like you, they know you're professional. It could be a great business development tool. <clears throat> so you can do an open house and you can do it safely. <clears throat> you need to have a security walkthrough if you're hosting someone else's open house, you need to make sure that valuables are out of sight. I had an agent who said, I was going to host an open house and there was a butcher block with knives in the kitchen. She said, nope. If it was her listing, she would have told them to put it away. But in this situation, she had to tell the sellers um, of someone else's listing, get that out of sight. We talked about um, increasing witness potential by letting the neighbors know you're going to be there alone. Agents, agents, agents. Having your purses, your laptops, your tablets on the counter while you're greeting people in the living room. It's just opening you up to be victimized. 
your purses, anything of value, your office keys, your house keys, someone can take it in a heartbeat while you're not paying attention. So imagine the nightmare of trying to let your broker know that the office keys have been stolen, your house keys have been stolen, your car keys. Better to keep valuables out of sight. Even in your car, if you need your tablet or your um, laptop, go get it, but then come back in. Um, I had an agent who said, I, I called her out on it. It's like, your purse is on this island in this kitchen and you're not even in here. What are you thinking? He said, well, usually I stick it in a cabinet. I didn't do it this time. All it takes is one time. So valuables out of sight. Lock up at the end. Make sure you are alone and that you're turning over an empty house. Um, I don't have to say the um, don't park in the driveway because you can get blocked in. I think everyone knows that by now. So let's see. Any questions so far? We're coming to the end and I want to make sure I get the questions answered because I will probably run right up against the clock and run out of time for questions. Anybody have any questions or anything? Any comments so far? Okay, I am going to keep rolling. Most agents, 73% said that they have protocols that they follow with every client. That number seems high. I am hopeful that it's true, but in the situation of the survey, it's more females than males. After hearing what you've heard today, knowing that male agents are just as vulnerable, I want that number to come a little bit closer and that male agents realize that they are, uh, they're vulnerable as well. Thank you for, thank you, Veronica. Excellent job, great info, thank you. And I hope I'm not talking too fast, but we have a lot to cover and we're going to wrap up with the artificial intelligence information and we're going to wrap up with the cybersecurity information. That's woven into every program. Again, lessons learned, stories to tell about each. I actually look forward to the day where there won't be any stories to tell because that means that everyone's doing what they're supposed to do in order to stay safe. But until then, I will continue to talk. This is what I was born to do. So open houses, fair housing, discrimination. Open houses can be kind of wild. I had um, an agent say they feel like a sitting duck in an open house. Um, one thing that you want to do is you want to make sure you're never accused of fair housing or discrimination while you're hosting an open house. It's kind of hard to do because anyone can come in, right? I had an agent who said, and here's a story, but it just so happens that it's a female agent and it maybe would be male perpetrator. Keep in mind, Criminals come in both genders. So this agent said that she sat where she could see who was approaching. So she could see who's coming just to get a feel. She said, I know I can't judge them, but I at least want to get a feel. She saw a late model car pull up. A guy got out, nice looking, clean cut guy. Nothing odd or different about him, she said. But all of a sudden, the warning bells were sounding. She said, I had that feeling in the pit of my stomach. I knew I was in danger. She said, I got up quickly and I locked the door. She couldn't put her finger on it, but she just knew something was wrong. And then he's knocking and ringing the doorbell. She's screaming through the door, I'm closed. He said, no, you're not. I just saw someone leave. She said, I am closed now. So what she did is she waited till he left. He was out of sight. She got her stuff together. She got out of there, locked up and got out of there. So here's what she did right. Number one, she heard her gut. She trusted her gut. She did not allow him to enter the house. She wasn't willing to take that chance. Number two, she was close to everyone. She didn't wait for someone who came along who looked okay. She was close to every single person. So that way she stayed out of trouble. So definitely listen to your gut in that situation. And I can't say it enough. Don't worry about being embarrassed. Do what it takes to get out. Okay, uh, Pam. Ha Pamela has a comment. She said, I always have a partner witness. Thank you. That's the right, that's the way to think. Always have a witness with you. Lock the front door before before turning off the lights. That's leading, leaving the um open house. Excellent point. And then that also brings up another question. I um I here's what I do. This morning I sat in a safety class, someone else's safety class. I'm constantly listening to other um, safety professionals speak. I'm always learning and listening and hearing what other people are saying. The question came up, should you lock the door when you're showing a property? Do you lock yourself in with your client or do you leave the door open? So there are two schools of thought. One is to leave it unlocked. That way, if something goes wrong, you can get out in a hurry. Number two is lock it. That keeps the bad people from coming in. The proper answer is there's no right or wrong answer. It depends on the circumstance. It depends on the situation. If you're in a neighborhood where there's a lot of loitering, a lot of people standing out, in that situation, you lock the door behind you. 
if you have truly vetted your client, you know they are real, they are who they say they are, and they're not a criminal, then you lock the door behind you to keep the bad guys out. So there's no right or wrong answer. So thank you for bringing that up. Okay, here is another business development tool. You're gonna to wanna to pay attention to this one. This one, I have given away thousands upon thousands through the years. Who here likes Fispos? You like them, you wanna list their properties, but guess what? They don't like you. They don't respect you. They don't respect the work that you do. Sorry, but it's true. Because they think they can do the job that you do. All you have to do is put a sign in the yard, sell your house, save the commission, right? They honestly believe that. They don't respect your, your experience and the wisdom and the professionalism you bring to the job. So if you want to list a FISBO, how do you do that? Lead with safety. You are the real estate agent who's not contacting them saying, hey, I've got a buyer for you. They've heard that before. Hey, let me show you how to market your house. They don't want your help. What you're doing is you're stapling your business card to this PDF that I have created for you. You are going to download it at the link at the end. And I think that Elsie has put the link in the um, comments or we'll do it at the end. You're going to download that PDF. You are going to staple your business card to it. Whenever you see a FISBO, you are going to mail it to them, hand it to them, stick it in their door handle, their door um, knob, whatever. You are going to show them that you are looking out for their safety. You are not talking to them about making money or selling your house because they think they can do it. But you are saying to them, I am a safety conscious, safety trained agent. I am showing you how to do this in a safe manner. You're talking to them about not letting strangers into their house. The sheet talks about medicine out of medicine cabinets, jewelry out of jewelry boxes, things they're not thinking about. You are telling them not to show alone, get a partner, let someone know that you're about to show a stranger. Hmm? You're talking to them about screening someone before you show them. You are telling them that they are not to, to that they need to have witnesses, right? By the time they get to number 13, they're thinking, whoa. What was I thinking? This is more dangerous. This is jeopardizing my family and our safety. Whose business card do you think is going to rise to the top of the stack? The one that's stapled to the sheet. You're leading with safety. You're doing what other real estate agents won't do. You're talking about keeping the consumer safe. I wrote an article about it, but then again, you're getting the PDF and I want to hear from you if you're using it. If you're out there using it, let me know if it's working for you. Let me know the response and the reaction that you are getting from those um, FISBOs, especially when you're coming to them to be of service as opposed to asking for something, I wanna know. Um, some of the lessons we learned from the pandemic um, office, uh, that, that's an article that I want you to read. The number one takeaway is a virtual meetings that everybody can do it now. People were doing it, no more excuses that we don't know how to do virtual. Everybody can do it, be more productive and be more safe. Um, when I go to offices, I get an opportunity to walk through. I see agents with their phones on their desk and their tablets and their laptops and just trustingly on their desk. My question to you is why? I've had agents say, oh, I trust my fellow agents. I'm not talking about your fellow agents. I'm talking about the service people, the contractors, the other buyers, the other sellers in the office, people that you don't know. Put your valuables out of sight when you're in your office, okay? Get them out of sight, just stick them in a chair, put it under the desk or put it in a drawer. Same thing with your car. Agents love technology and burglar and thieves know. Go to a real estate parking line. You can look in and probably see all kinds of electronics and devices that you just couldn't carry in. Valuables out of sight. I want to get through the rest of these slides here. If you have any questions, just put them in the chat. Let me know. We have 15 minutes left and I'm going to make the most of it. Hold on to your hats. Um, here you, every, all of us are on social media. You're supposed to be. You have to be in this day and age to stay relevant, right? What you need to know is that social engineers are on there as well. Social engineers, are, their job is to trick you out of information in order to steal your identity. They want you to give up your password and they're going to be nice, they're gonna be fun, they're doing whatever it takes to get you to give that information up without you paying attention. Think about some of those fun games, the pet name, the street you lived on, uh, your first love, your favorite teacher, all of that information. Those are fun games that you play. You want to see what your friends are going to say, where everybody wants to see what you're saying. Social engineers are paying attention. They're the ones who plant these games out there. Think about if you ever get locked out of your account. You get an email saying, here's a security challenge. 
What's the name of your first pet? What street did you grow up on? See where I'm going with this? So you need to be careful. They're trying to trick you into sharing information that you normally wouldn't share. Proceed with caution. Every one of you should be Googling yourself on a regular basis just to see what's out there. Um, again, crimes against real estate agents are often predatory. That maybe will be criminal. They're looking you up. They're trying to see what they can learn about you. So anytime you publish anything, anything that you're doing, know that maybe the bad guy could be looking at it. So be very careful. <laughs> oh, excuse me. Allergies. <laughs> excuse me. Of course, it waits till the end, but at least I guess it waited till the end. Okay, so, okay, there's the link there. Okay, so let us talk a little bit about doing your research. Uh, most agents feel um, unsafe after they get a, a, an inappropriate email, text message, phone, or voicemail. That's a lot. If it's 33% and you have 1.5 1 .1, million realtors, that's a lot. One thing you need to do is if you're going to Google yourself and you think you're not going to do it on a regular basis, set up a Google alert. Put all of the addresses of your listings into a Google alert. That means if anything is ever published with that address, you're going to get a message, whether it's on a Craigslist, it could be published on Facebook, anywhere it's published, you will get an email. That way, if a cyber or a criminal decides they're going to hijack your listing and use it as a Craigslist listing, you get an email and you will know it and you can be of service to the seller and you can go to them and you can say, hey, your information is out here. You need to get it taken off a of Craigslist. You need to put signage up. So do whatever it takes to be a good real estate agent to be of service. By setting up those Craigslist, um, I'm sorry, the Google alerts, that's another service that you're doing to protect the sellers. I want to talk really quickly about Nextdoor. Is anyone here on Nextdoor? If so, you can just put a yes um, in the comment section, in the chat section. I am addicted to Nextdoor. In my neighborhood, Nextdoor will let me know what's going on. I can never say I don't know what's happening. I see a few yeses. I want real estate agents to start using Nextdoor to help develop their businesses. Let me tell you how Nextdoor can help you be an expert in your neighborhood. First of all, it can keep you safe. Nextdoor has like 260,000 neighborhoods, not people, but entire neighborhoods. In my neighborhood, I know if anyone's car is stolen, if someone's house gets broken into, um, most neighborhoods, you can find out if there are any disputes with the homeowners association. If there's any new development coming to town, council people jump in there. Be the neighbor, the real estate agent that's active on next door. If someone is ever looking for a property, they'll jump on next door. Hey, anyone, you know, do you know of a house or anything? Don't be the agent. Say, I'm a real estate agent. I can tell you something. Don't be that agent, but be of service. If you can point them to someone, take a look at some of the conversations that's going on. Be that agent. You can start a group on next door. I like live music. I started a live music group. And all of a sudden, like almost 300 people are jump, jumping in there. It's like, whoa, it's a whole community. I talked to a real estate agent who was a skier. And he started a group of ski people in the city where he lived. And everybody knows he's a real estate agent that has the ski community. So think about when those skiers need to buy a house, they know a real estate agent who is part of their community. Or you can just be a part of the conversation. If someone's talking about something, you can, if someone's, if you're a gardener, someone's talking about gardening, you can say, hey, I can help you with that. Here's where I go. If they look at your profile, they'll know that you are a real estate agent. If you see crimes that are occurring, just be the one who can say, um, you know, contact, here's the number to the police department. You can make a, um, you can uh, make a report. If you see all these stories about catalytic thefts, you can say, here's a recommendation. I know this guy who this mechanic that does cages or this mechanic can mark it. And here's an article. Be the agent who's being of service. If they check out your profile, they can know it's you. Plus it helps you know what's going on in your neighborhood. Someone started a group about real estate agents in a certain, or real estate in a certain area. That's where they share their market report, anything going on in the market. So you can be the agent. You can start a group. It is free. There's more engagement on Nextdoor from regular people who have been vetted, who really live in a neighborhood. So definitely consider that. That's my live music group. So definitely consider it on your profile. Put that you're a real estate agent. If you're contributing good, helpful information, they look at your profile, they'll see that you're a real estate agent. So if they get a postcard from you, a mailing from you, a phone call from you, they know who you are. So use that to build your business. I even built a whole class around using Nextdoor to um, virtually farm, virtually market. Neighbors by Ring, that's the same thing. It's a community. Be a part of the community.
I'm looking at the clock and I, I need to get to the AI stuff. So um, auto safety, that's your second office. You need to make sure you have a plan, auto club, make sure you have the proper tools in your car. I will never ever be in a car without jumper cables. Even with an auto club, what if I'm sitting there and my car won't start and I'm waiting for the auto club to come and someone's saying, I can help you, but no one has jumper cables. Jumper cables should be in every single car. You need to have a, a cell phone signal booster, especially if you're in a rural area or there's not good Wi-Fi signals. I did a tour through North Dakota, no Wi-Fi. Can you imagine that? It was a nightmare. So I learned, I had to buy a phone when I was there. I learned about signal boosters. Um, Google Maps has a way for you to share your location. So you plug in where you're going to go and then you get to say that you wanna share your trip with someone. I chose my sister, Stacy. So Stacy knows where I am. I can limit how long she can have access to my location. I can say, you know, for these next two or three hours, Stacy can see where I am. Or you, I had an agent who said, I do it 365 days, 24 seven. She said, my husband and my son can always see where I am. And I had an agent say, I don't want my wife knowing where I am all the time. He said, she could think I'm working and I could be playing golf. You get to choose who can see your location. You get to choose how long they see it. And then keep in mind, Google Maps allows you to get a street view. They can take a look at where you are. If you don't answer, they can look and see the outside of where you are. They can do a street view, get a feel for the neighborhood. You can do that while previewing. So I've talked to you about sellers. I've talked to you about FISBOs and how you can serve them and build your business. Let's talk a little bit about buyers. If a buyer says that I want um, you to tell me if this is a good neighborhood, is it a safe neighborhood? You already know you can't answer that question, right? Be a resource instead of saying, eh, can't help you. Spotcrime.com is a resource. You give it to them, let them plug in information. You need to do it as well. Plug in your home information and you can get a feel for the crime that surrounds you in your neighborhood. But this is a resource you're giving to the buyers and you're also telling them to have um, a law enforcement. To, to go to law enforcement to get the statistics as well. So spotcrime.com. So you are helping. Okay, so phishing is a way that the cyber criminals are sending you emails, trying to get you to give up information that you normally wouldn't get, a letter, email, a post on social media. We talked about the social engineering. Pass phrases instead of passwords. Passwords, easy to guess. Pass phrases, not so much. So you need to be very cyber aware. Again, I have a whole class on cybersecurity, but my cybersecurity classes have morphed into artificial intelligence classes because cyber criminals are using those tools to be a cyber criminal and to victimize not only you, but the consumer. So the question is artificial intelligence, friend or foe? It can be both. My job is for you to know how to use it in a safe manner. I know you have upcoming safety that's going to blow, uh, upcoming AI training that will blow your mind. Um, you're going to learn how to use it to be more productive, how to be, um, how to create more content. It's fabulous. One thing I want you to keep in mind is how to use it in a safe manner. So you need to know that anything good can be bad. The question is, will technology, will artificial in intelligence replace real estate agents? And you're going to hear this one too. No, but an agent using it will. They will run circles around those who just refuse to use it. Um, yeah, go ahead and raise your hand if you have a question. We've got five minutes left. So I wanna make sure I get all questions answered. I had an agent who said, artificial intelligence can't look someone in the eye, shake their hand, smile and laugh at them. I wanna make sure you see a humanoid called a mecca. Mecca can look at you. She was interviewed by a reporter. So yes, it can actually be there. It can actually talk to you, but it's still artificial intelligence. So digital impersonation is a deep fake. One thing that you need to know is that you can use, um, if you have ChatGPT, it's been hacked. If you have payment information and you have the pay plan, then you have experienced that just like any other website. So you still need to handle your business as far as setting up secure um, methods, keeping in mind that on social media, there's no such thing as privacy. Um, AI also includes face detection. That's the thumbprint also that's to get into your phone. The iris, the eye detection, that's all artificial intelligence. With the good comes the bad. Um, this lady pregnant at eight months was arrested because her artificial intelligence, her face matched someone else's face. It wasn't accurate. So there are good, there are bad. 
you all remember the grandma phone calls where a kid supposedly would call, hey, grandma, could you send me some money? I'm hurt or I'm in trouble. Don't tell mom and dad. That scam worked. Criminals, cyber criminals are using artificial intelligence. I used it to create that grandma. She is not real. I used Dally or uh, Mid Journey to create her. The CEO scam is how it shows in real estate. <clears throat> It used to be that you would get a text message. This is your broker. Go get a gift card. I'm in a meeting and I need you to send a gift card. Give me the number to the gift card really quickly. I'm in a hurry. Now, cyber criminals are using artificial intelligence to impersonate voices. They can duplicate your broker's voice and make it make a phone call and tell you to do the exact same thing. Wire money, uh, pay this invoice. So you need to be alert and aware that artificial intelligence is impersonating people. That's called the deep fake. Um, there are red flags if they're urgent and if they're asking for money or information, you need to be careful. One thing you can do is say, let me call you right back. More than likely, they're going to hang up. ChatGPT is probably the leader of them all. There's Bing, there's Bart, there's Claude. Um, ChatGPT4 is the paid version. It also spews misinformation, sometimes worse than ChatGPT3. You can never believe anything you see or what you read or what you hear anymore. Now, these tools can help you be more productive. If you have a PDF, Claude can actually summarize what's on the PDF and then bullet point it for you. What you need to know is that information is not private. If you enter or upload client information or even your company information, financial data, anyone can read it. So remove the identifying information before you upload that into these tools. Um, invoices, if, if you have your personal, your bank information on there, it can see it and share it with the world. So be very careful. I'm just going to zip through. We're winding up here about two or three minutes. Um, ChatGPT3 will allow, or four will allow you to give it a command. It's going to produce something for you. It could be a document, social media, blog post. You'll learn that. But keep in mind that cyber criminals are using these tools too. Canva has a way that it will create something that you want, information, content, perfectly grammatically correct. So those wire change emails that your clients are getting, now cyber criminals are using them. They're going to be perfectly grammatically correct. So you need to warn them that they need to look out for that. Um, the deep fakes include a picture of someone, someone putting someone else's face on it, making it say and do something it didn't do. You know, Queen Elizabeth did not get up and dance like that. It was a cyber criminal who decided to put her face on Queen Elizabeth's body and make it do things. That Pentagon news story was a deep fake. When Ukrainian President Zelensky appeared and he said, lay down your weapons, it was a deep fake. So understand um, Canva has an erase tool. If cyber criminals can erase something as part of a, um, a real estate transaction, I erase the plant. They can erase a defect or anything material with the property. Understand that that is a way criminals can work. You can use it for good to remove clutter from a cabinet, a countertop. The cyber criminals can use it too. These pictures do not exist in real life. These are all deep fakes that I created. So if you are reached, if someone reaches out to you, you need to be careful. Um, these tools cannot get hands and fingers right. So that's a tell. You also need to be careful. And I am looking at the clock and I am at time. Let me wind it up here. Ransomware, and we all know the MLS breach. Um, the ransomware breach, it's a cyber crime. Humans are the number one thing that it takes to be able to commit a cyber crime. You, it's not your device, it's you. You are the key. If you download something, if you click on something, then you are going to be a cyber victim. Learn how to back up your information. Antivirus and security software is important. I'm going to zoom through these so slides as I wrap up here. Um, no more free email. Those are easier to hack. Uh, you must have a passcode and you must make sure you have two-factor authentication because cyber criminals won't have access to it. That's how you spell forewarn that I talked to you about. Um, Avast is a free antivirus software and I haven't had a virus since I used it and I had an a IT guy tell me that that's what to do. You can't detect if something is written use, using artificial intelligence. You just have to do your homework. Uh, the detectors don't work. We talked about social media. You can't believe what you see or read. Um, okay, number one tool for safety is pepper spray. Number two is a weapon. So whatever your tool is, practice it and make sure you know how to use it. 
look at the NAR website for the update on the hashtag M2, the sexual harassment policy. Make sure you are not violating anyone's rights, whether you think it's innocent or not. You just need to be extra careful. Are there any questions that I can answer for you? Any feedback, any comments that anyone want to share? Tracy, I did and keep it hand up from Jim uh -oh. earlier. I don't know if you saw the question, Jim. You can unmute if you want to speak. Okay, Jim. So while we're waiting for Jim to unmute, here's your homework. Have I been pwned.com? Enter your email address or your phone number into that website. You're going to get a list of companies that have had security breaches, which means any of those companies, it could be Canvas, Salesforce, Poshmark, any of those companies have had breaches. And that means that your password is out there. You need to change those passwords immediately. So everyone do that today. Have I been pwned.com? Share that with the consumer. Say, I learned about this. So that's an opportunity for you to reach out, to be safe, to tell them that you're looking out for their safety and to find out, um, they can find out whether or not their password needs to be changed. Okay, Jim, you had a question? Well, mine wasn't a question. Mine was back when we, when you're talking about people coming into an open house and locking the doors and how to show the property. Mm -hmm. Simple thing is when listing agents put a lockbox on a house, be mindful of who's going to show it. Don't put it on the side of the house on the gas meter, in the planter, and don't put it uh, on the very low on the on a gate on the front, so that people you got your back to people when you're unlocking the lockbox on the side or at the front when you've got to kneel down. Those are, and you did cover the one of um, basements and second stories. Uh, always let them go up first, you go up afterwards. So you've got, you're not trapped in. Those are three things I, that are very simple, really simple, but I wanted to add those to it. And I was, that was like 10 minutes ago, so. Um, oh, I didn't see. I'm sorry. I didn't see it. But you I'm were kind of wrapping, kind of. You kind of wanted to roll things along, but I thought those, right, those, but, those are important to add. And I agree with you, especially about the location. Of, I just heard that somewhere else about the location of the lockbox. Be considerate of your other, your fellow agents, so that they can access it without turning their back to someone or having to bend over. Excellent point. Um, this booklet is a free cybersecurity booklet that you get to download um, again for free with the link that um, that Elsie put in the comment section, Drive with NAR, the safety series. The podcast drops the third Monday of every month. There are two episodes out, take a look. All of these articles I've written, a lot of them about AI, cybersecurity. Again, I have a whole class on that. Here is the agent from the first episode who shared her story with us. I'd love for you to read that. I mean, to listen to the podcast and hear that and to support her. There's the Facebook group, but then again, it's going to be in the link. So you can either do the QR code here or Elsie was kind enough to put the link in there. If no one else has any questions, I want to thank you all so much. And I hope I didn't talk to you too fast. And I want to make sure you all stay safe.